Hello everyone, you welcome to this edition of the Prime Time Newscast on Ekinos Television live from our headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, we're going to be zooming on the state of some schools in the Republic of Cameroon ahead of school resumption. Some of the school buildings are in an advanced state of dilapidation. We'll be showing you some in this newscast and we'll also take a look at the problem of bad roads in the Republic of Cameroon. We'll be taking you to Makba in the Nun Division West region of the country where we're going to show you the bad state of some roads there begging for rehabilitation. Stay with us. few weeks to school resumption in the Republic of Cameroon. Several schools are still in a deplorable state. Buildings in some of the primary and secondary schools are in an advanced state of dilapidation. In the northwest and southwest regions of the country, many schools have simply gone out of existence as a result of the deepening socio-political and security crisis eating up those parts of the country northwest and southwest regions for close to four years uh, today many of the schools have been uh, burnt down and in other parts of the country the buildings are in a deplorable state and a case in point in this newscast is the government bilingual school uh, government bilingual primary school Mbanga Pongo in the Dwala 3 uh, subdivision and the school uh, structure is in a pathetic uh, state. We take you to that part of the country's economic capital to show you just how the buildings of that school look like. In Cameroon, this is what goes for a public primary school less than a month to the start of the 2020-2021 school year. Difficult to believe that this structure is an existing school building, but we are at Government Bilingual School Mbanga Pongo in the Dwala 3 subdivision. An uncompleted makeshift structure with worn out planks and destroyed zinc. This is where parents of Mbanga Pongo will bring their kids come October the 6th, 2020. Lucas say no school official has come around to coordinate kids registration and the head teacher is nowhere to be found as this narrowed to October the 6th 2020. They do not understand why a whole government bilingual school created over three years ago should be neglected as such. At government bilingual school Mbanga Pongo, there are no blackboard and benches are few. The soil or the surface leaves nothing to be desired in a learning environment. Learners here will have no possibility to be clean or healthy as we learned that the makeshift structure has been transformed into a hideout for wild and domestic animals. In one of the classrooms could be seen some 20 benches donated by the Dweller Fee Council, but the people say they have sent several requests for construction to the same council with no positive outcome this far. The present structure was raised by sufficient space, Lucas indicated. At some 250 meters away from government bilingual school Mbanga Pungu is government nursery school Mbanga Pungu, a local restaurant building rented by members of the Parents Teachers Association to host the nursery school. The nursery school building is also wanting in equipment and has nothing worth a government nursery school building in an economic capital city like Douala. Government bilingual school Mbangapungu on its part has a total of four classrooms with two completely covered by zinc and two others exposed without zinc to the sun and rain. The next structure intended to serve as the fifth classroom is in a pathetic state. 
In the crisis hit northwest and southwest regions of the Republic of Cameroon, the problem is even more uh, critical as a result of the deepening anglophone crisis pulling on for close to four years today. And in several parts of the two English speaking regions of the country, many schools have simply not been operational or have gone out of existence. Some of them have been uh, burnt down. And of course, the situation is quite uh, critical in the over 200 uh, villages bent down according to information from the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa uh, indicating that over 200 and more villages have been bent down and schools are no longer existing in those areas. Many of the people have fled as a result of the increasing and repeated or recurrent violence and gun battles between separatist fighters and elements of the national armed forces and now we're going to take you to magba in the non division mongo uh, non division west region of the republic of cameroon and there we're going to show you the bad state of some uh, roads leading to uh, leading out of that locality to parts of the littoral and even the northwest region of the country makulit fogwe has more The road linking Mandar and Magba, localities in the Nun Division, West Region of Cameroon, in advanced state of dilapidation. The muddy and slippery nature of the road has practically affected circulation. Drivers, while plying on the stretch, get stuck in giant potholes. In order to remedy the situation, some youths in the area have mobilized themselves to help drivers pull out their stuck vehicles, while some of them use pits to screen the mud in order to make it accessible. Others attach a rope to the vehicle to pull it out for a thorkun. Oh, oh. 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 The nature of the road is very horrible. We've had a series of cars that are not able to plow the road. We are struggling to assist to see how to help the cars move out of this place. Due to insecurity, the population of Dungamantum in the northwest region of Cameroon are now obliged to use the stretch which links the region to other cities. This is the road leading to Magba. It is the road that is serving many people coming from Dungamantum now. Since the road passing through with division has been blocked by the Amber Boys. So the road has become a very, very important road for those coming from Donga Mantum. All the cars coming from Donga Mantum pass through this road, through Madba to Bafusam. Road users are urging authorities to include the construction of a stretch of road in the reconstruction program of the Northwest region. And still on the road, several bridges. Uh, in a bad state, many of them have become uh, what the population or road users describe as dead traps. And a case in point in this news case is the bridge over River Kui on the Magba Mandu Road. Innocent as it has more. It takes a whole lot of energy for one to cross over to the next neighborhood after the bridge linking the two neighborhoods was taken away by water on August 21, 2020. We are at the Makepe neighborhood where the link between St. Tropez and Misoke has been broken as the bridge is no longer there. Voilà un grand pont comme ça qui relie deux quartiers. This is a big bridge that links two neighborhoods. All of the time we look for wood to arrange it by contributing money. Not too long we started a bridge that even cars passed on it, but heavy runoff took it away. People now move on pipe and fall inside water. We recently removed a man who fell and died. Porter le pont entièrement pour partir. Nous sommes là, on vit très mal. Voilà les gens qui traversent sur le tuyau que vous voyez là. 
Il tombe même dans l'eau. Hier, on a retiré un corps ici, là, dans l'eau. The pipe that was placed by the company in charge of water is now serving as a bridge to these inhabitants. But again, it's dangerous because recently a man slipped off the pipe and fell inside the water. He later gave up the ghost. As a result of the absence of the bridge linking Makepe Misoke and Saint Tropez, the inhabitants are forced to pay 300 francs CFA on commercial motorcycles for someone living from one end to the other end of the neighborhood. They are all calling on government to intervene. <laughs> Le gouvernement devait vraiment... We are in danger, so automatically the government is supposed to take care of us. If it goes worse today, we are finished. Si ça vient, peut-être on fuit pour aller de l'autre côté, ou de terre, ou peut-être en bas, ou en haut, on ne sait pas comment on va fuir, parce que c'est grave. Recently, the Minister of Territorial Administration was in Douala, where he visited and handed gifts to some flood victims in the locality. Unfortunately, these inhabitants say they were left out. I just heard about the distribution of basic commodities to flood victims. They forgot us in this zone. They informed us late in the night. The population is now calling on the municipal authorities and government to act fast. That was rather smart. You can get by reporting there on a similar situation in the Dweller 5 subdivision with over 300 cases of obstetric fistula registered in the far north region of Cameroon and over 2,000 cases registered nationwide. The Ministry of Public Health is stepping up efforts to fight that public health problem. Details in this report compiled by Immaculate Fogwe. Findings made by health personnel in Cameroon say more than 20,000 women suffer from obstetric fistula. A fistula is an abnormal opening in the birth canal that results to chronic leakage of urine and feces. During this period, the soft tissues of the pelvic are compressed between the baby's head and the mother's pelvic bones. The affliction is high in the far north region of Cameroon for the following reasons. Is it a surprise? You will say no, it's not a surprise because we know that risk factors of obstetric fistulas are among others home delivery delivery without a health assistant secondary delivery in period and we know that these main risk factors are really available in the far north region that's why it is really credible that so many women are suffering from upset fistula in this region about 300 cases have been registered in the far north region in 2019 with 53 cases adjusted. It is for this reason that the regional hospital of Marwa deemed it necessary to create a center for patients to carry out routine care. I have been suffering with obstetric fistula for several months. I've been operated upon and now I feel much better. Before, I had issues with my urinary tract. I'm very happy because everything went on well. It was done free of charge. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci à tous les docteurs. The center was inaugurated by the governor Mijiawa Bakari, accompanied by the regional delegate of public health. We have visited several women who are suffering with obstetric fistula. Many of them were operated successfully. We are going to hold other meetings to sensitize the population because many of them are not aware that such a center exists. On several occasions, women suffering with a disease are often abandoned or neglected by their husbands and family members. The Obstetric Fistula Center in Mara will be able to attend to the needs of the affected population. Ahead of the September 22nd planned protests of militants, sympathizers and supporters of the CRM political party and other uh, leaders in the Republic of Cameroon, administrative authorities continue taking measures to ensure that public peace and stability 
uh, preserved according to them the measures are intended to avoid a chaotic situation that could erupt from public uh, manifestations across the national territory and the latest administrative authority to take such decision is the governor of the west region of the country who signed a release banning all undeclared public protests in his area of command and the public authorities indicate that these measures are intended to preserve public peace and stability now out of Cameroon, the United States has imposed sanctions on the Gambia's former first lady, Zineb Jami, after accusing her of corruption during her husband, Yaya Jami's rule. The United States Treasury said she was suspected to have helped him in the illegal transfer of money and controlled his assets abroad. According to the Gambia's Justice Ministry, Yaya Jami stole $50 million before he was ousted in 2017. The couple has previously denied any wrongdoing. Yaya Jami's 22-year rule in the Gambia was marred by allegations of human rights violations, including extrajudicial killings, torture, and arbitrary detention. Still in news out of Cameroon, the former head of the Athletics governing body, Lamin Diak, has been jailed after being found guilty of corruption. The 87-year-old Senegalese faced corruption and money laundering charges linked to the Russian doping scandal, and Diak was convicted of accepting bribe or bribes from alleged suspected of doping to cover up test results and letting them continue competing. This happened in the 2012 London Olympics and other international competitions. He was sentenced to four years in prison. Jack's lawyers said he will be appealed against the judgment, which they called unfair and inhumane. Lamin Diak was also given a maximum fine of 500,000 euros. He was investigating, or he was investigated by French authorities for four years over claims. He took payment of more than 3 million euros to cover up cheating. The judges said his actions had undermined the values of athletics and the fight against doping. Diak has been under house arrest in Paris since November 2015. And that's it for the first part of this newscast. Talking point is coming up next. Today we are receiving a civil society leader, a peace crusader, an international peace crusader, Jacques Jacqueline Ndogmu, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. You are the president of WILF Cameroon and you also coordinate the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom on the African continent. Yes. Thanks for joining That's us today. Right. Uh, before we uh, get into uh, issues concerning peace uh, in the Republic of Cameroon, I want your reaction on this information uh, streaming into our studios from the north region, notably in Pitwa, where a lady is said to have killed her two children, chopping their bodies up and putting parts of the body in a pot, something like that. Jonathan, to be very honest, as I've, I have never seen such an horror from a mother on her children in my whole life. I have never seen chopping her own children, putting in a pot, maybe to cook. No, no. That's just very horrible and awful. I cannot justify that. There is no reason in the world which can justify this type of act. But I want to say that uh, when we conducted the gender conflict analysis last year, we had to meet with women in the communities. The aim was to understand the root causes of conflicts. When we spoke with women, we were able to understand that women undergo a lot. They go through a lot. So there's a lot of trauma going on. I'm not justifying. So my issue is that when even mad women, even mad women who have uh, children, they do take care of their children. In this specific case, 
I feel that it's a very, very serious case of trauma. Profound. There is something very, very wrong. I was but going to ask you, uh, as a mother that you are, yeah. what could have transpired? What could have gone through the, the, the mind or the heart of that mother to the extent that she killed her own children? I, I know. That I, that's why I'm saying that it's very important. I'll, I'll go with the recommendation because it's very important to, be, to pay attention at different levels, at family level, at community level. I cannot imagine what went wrong, but at least what I can know is that something went wrong, very, very wrong. And maybe for so many years, she has been going through some very bad situation, I cannot tell. I know of cases of women who in the past have killed their children to punish, in quotes, the husband. But I've never seen a case of a woman killing and chopping her own children. What I want to say is that, for me, the advice is what we uh, indicated in our report, the gender conflict analysis report, is to, a, a kind of trying to ensure that we have um, established uh, like um, support, psychosocial support units. They are very, very important to address this type of situation, to help women who are going through a very very lot of trauma. Yes, because there are a lot of traumatic situations. I am not, and I cannot justify what happened to this woman, but I'm saying that it's very important at different level. That is why I, I will encourage that at family level, we increase the dialogue, mother and children, husband and wife, brother and sister, so, so that in case of any situation, one might discover that there is something going wrong. It's very, very important. And also we, as women's leaders, women's organization, we should also increase our work that we are doing on the field. One of the things that we have to put an emphasis on is to have more cohesion spaces. In these cohesion spaces, we have women coming together, sharing their experiences, and then supporting one another. So that in case a woman has a situation, maybe to, she will listen to the other one and feel a bit comforted. So I want to say that this is a very horrific situation. It's very bad. But uh, my advice is to move forward to prevent this type of situation in the future by increasing dialogue at different community and also ensuring that in the communities at different level we have psychosocial support units i just want us to extrapolate a little bit from this case to uh, look at the issue from a global perspective the management of pressure uh, brought to bear on a woman who is taking care of herself one, two, three, four children, the husband, okay. she's going to work and have all of these things bringing uh, pressure. Added to that, some husbands who misbehave, some fathers who misbehave, all this pressure brought to bear on the woman, how to manage this. Yes, that's why I'm saying that this case should really go along to teach us a lesson at different level, because even men, when we want to talk to a man, no man in the world would like to see her, his daughter being treated in a, in a certain way. So you should consider your wife as your peer, as your friend, and tr try to give her a supporting hand. I know that women go through a lot, both physically and also psychologically. So I would recommend that in the community level, in the family level, women, we should break, break this... Um, uh, idea that we have that every all the house chores are, are for the women. No, no, no. It's very important to know that a woman is also a human being and she can also get tired. So whether the children, the husband, they should also provide a helping hand. And then also it's very important for the in the couple to have dialogue. Because if there is the dialogue, I'm very sure that the woman will be, will be open. And in case of any difficulty, she will be able to, to, to talk to her husband. But in many cases, in our context, that dialogue is not always there. And the, 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 the power relation, the power. You know, the, some, some men badly use the power. And that power brings or creates negative situation. So that women are unable to speak out. So this type of thing leads to frustration. And sometimes they will go through a lot and then they will not be able to, to speak out. Mm. So it's very important 
to look in the future by trying to see how we could prevent this by increasing dialogue, by increasing the support system to women. Mm. Somebody who may be listening to you now and believes and holds firm to some, um, in quotes, African values, values in quotes, because they may not necessarily be values when we get to analyze the, the, the issues, will tell you that asking a man to uh, take care of the baby, for example, clean the baby, bath, give a bath to the baby, and do uh, all of those things, go into the kitchen, cook, uh, fresh water, clean pits, clean the house, you know, is uh, like an attack on his manhood, is uh, undermining his manhood or his authority. As a man. Uh, yes, this question is bringing me to talk about a project that we are starting in at the Wilf Cameroon. It's called Challenging the Militarized Masculinities. It's about the power relation, the, the, the way the women, the men hold the power. It's about to let the men know that it's very important to work hand in hand if you want sustainable peace at different levels, including in your own house. You need to change the dynamic, to change the way you, uh, you, 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 you relate with, with others. And this should start in your family. So there is no African tradition which asks the woman to be treated like an, a, a less than a human being. Because if you expect your woman, your wife, sorry, to wake up in the morning from 6 to 6 to, do, to, to be doing everything, then there is a problem. No man would accept that. Maybe some men they will talk about their manhood, but the same men will not want their daughter to suffer from such a situation. So my advice is for men to consider their wives as the, their children. Let's their children and think, what if this happened to my, to my child? So I think that the African tradition that most of the time we kind of portray saying that, yes, we are, no, it's not, it's not about men standing against you. No, no, no. That's not the fight. The fight is how... Mutual respect. How is mutual respect. How can we together, how can we, men and women, work together for the interest of our family, for the interest of our children, for the interest of the community, for the interest of our countries? How do we come on board together? It's not how do I... Uh, stand against my husband, how do I stand against my No, that's not it. It's to bring all the effort together for the common uh, purpose. And the Bible says that women should be submissive and that husbands should love their wives. Yes, I think it's just for me, it's about the respect. It's a, it is very simple. It's just mutual respect and confidence, as simple as that. All right. Now let's talk um, about the women who are in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, or some of them who have escape violence and they are now in different parts of the country, some in neighboring Nigeria, some in the bushes, who are going through very difficult and traumatizing situations. How can these women, who may be listening to you now, how can they manage these situations in which they find themselves? Who can do what to help them? My first advice to these women is to, the first thing to know that women are at the center of all the all the, the, the processes, all the peace processes. There is, as I always say, there is no peace with, without women. In spite of all what is happening, there will be no peace in the northward and southward without the women playing a key role. So I think that it's very important for them to speak out. Yes, to, to, to speak out because I know that some are going s uh, under such traumatic situation and then they are uh, unable to, to speak out. No, it's very important to speak out, to be supported. We just mentioned a case of a woman who chopped up her, her children. I'm not saying that that is the case, but because of this traumatic situation, women are able to, to maybe to go into what they cannot really uh, uh, tell. So it's very important to, to speak out. I also think that women uh, in the Northwest and Southwest are, are, can really support one on another. That's why uh, when we went to the communities, we were able to note that uh, it's true that some women react differently. Others shy away, they become very uh, introvert because of all what they are going through. 
On the contrary, others speak out. I don't think being introvert solves the situation. It's very important to, to relate with other women and to share their experience. And I think that uh, women's leaders, not only in the Northwest and Southwest, no, it's about all the women. They should come together and they should not stop for one minute to condemn. It's very important to condemn and show solidarity to those people suffering from all this. Because we have come to know that the, 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 the operation mode of the conflict is changing as they are, sp are passing. And women are becoming a kind of preferred target. It's very important for women all... Women and children. Yes, and children, of course. Very vulnerable. Yes, preferred target. We had, we had so many of cases of women chopped up in those regions. So it's very important for other women, not only in the Northwood and Southwood, to speak out about this, to condemn the situation, and then to come together and see how they can support. And it's also very important to hold go the government accountable because we have uh, the resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, on which um, enables women to be part and parcel and of peace processes. It's about protection. There's one pillar in that resolution which is about protection. How are women protected in the crisis? Women are not military. You see, many of them who are being killed, they are not military. So this um, pillar should be really uh, implemented and the government should make sure that the civilians and especially women and children are protected, are protected during this uh, war situation. Mm, some of the women um, already taking part in the struggle for change, for peace and normalcy in the country. For example, those who uh, are members of civil society organizations like Stand Up for Cameroon, Mothers of the yeah. Nation and so on. Those who are not part of such organizations, how can they contribute in the peace uh, process? You said the uh, women are at the center. What can they do to make sure that they adequately contribute to restore peace and normalcy across the board? When I, for example, I talk of, uh, for example, calling, condemning and calling for peace and holding the government accountable, it's about pointing out that there is something wrong. What is wrong is not only for the women in the English-speaking region. It's for all the women to stand up as women, not as women from the English-speaking region, to say no to this. You see? So it's not about asking the women from the north and south. To, no, no, that's not what I'm, we are saying. We are asking all women all to women be able to speak out. That's one. To be all, all to mobilize also and see how they can support their peers in those regions. And also, it's about education. You know, peace building, of course, we have a crisis, but we should look into the future. As we are doing this, we should also increase uh, effort in sensitizing and educating. It's about uh, trying to make sure that as we are addressing the conflict nowadays, we prevent more uh, conflict situation in the future by increasing education of the children, by increasing education in the communities. As so a preventive I measure. Very good. I think that showing solidarity is extremely important. And the solidarity is not only in the conflict zone, it's also out of the conflict zone. We have been able to go on the field and we feel that there are dynamics in the English speaking, Northwood and Southwest, that there are other dynamics in the host communities like the West region, like the littoral region, like the center region. And the women in those regions, they should show not only solidarity, but also provide support. There are many uh, women who flee from the north and south, who go to the west, to the center, to the east. They need accommodation, for example. They need their children to go back to school. So in that situation, other women in these host communities can provide support also by giving a helping hand, by accommodating some of these women, by helping some of them to send their children to school, by helping with some livelihood and so on and so forth. So I think it's not about the women in the Northwest and South, it's about all the women and then we should stand together as one to say no to this, what is happening on the field. Now, the women in other parts of the country, away from the Northwest and Southwest regions, um, some of them may not speak because of uh, the fear of some risk yeah. factors involved in speaking out. What is going to happen to them? If they speak out and they are attacked by people who don't like what they are saying, 
Same thing for those who are in the northwest and southwest regions and even all those who have fled the regions because of violence. If they speak out, probably the next day they're going to be attacked by one group or the other because of what they said. W what will you tell somebody, a woman who finds herself in this kind of situation? My, I will never ask a woman to go into trouble because she has spoken out, no. It's for every woman to analyze the situation. Even in the Northwest and Southwest, women, we understand why some women, they will come and, on secret and tell you something that they cannot say in public because they are afraid. So it all depends on what happened and it all depends on your environment. But in one way or the other, you should speak out. When I say out, you can relate to one organization like ours to, to, to say what is going on. We will be able to maybe to relate to the competent authorities or to address the issue without make, letting you know, letting them know that you are the one. It's very important because what if you don't speak, there is no way you can be helped. But if there is danger in you speaking out, it's about changing the methodology, seeing how to, to address it. In the gender conflict analysis that we conducted, we have so many testimonies. But in the testimony, when you read the testimonies, we will never see the name of the person. We will change the name for the security. So we make sure that we report what is going on the field, but we make sure that we pro pro protect the identity of the person speaking. Our main objective is to bring out the issue, not to, to, uh, to expose, to expose the, the, yeah, the victims the or victim. the speakers. If they don't speak out, if the, the government, all the stakeholders do not know what is going on in the field. It will be very difficult to provide sustainable solutions. So it's about trying to see how to put confidence in some uh, people, in some organization, and speaking what is going on and see how we can... That's what we do. We always listen to the women. As, so, as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Cameroon uh, <coughs> put in place a mechanism that can enable women to speak, yeah to channel information yeah. to you without being uh, exposed to the risk of any attack from whosoever. Thank you for this question. After the gender coffee analysis, after the election observation, we were able to understand and to see that women face so many uh, traumatic situations, so many types of violence even in the communities. And we are using our call center, 8243, to, to get out more information from the field. All the women or people who have information on all these women are going through, they call free on this number to give us the information. With the results of the gender conflict analysis and also the result of the election observation, we are now starting a project which is twofold. The first part is using the early, Women's Early Warning Center with the call center to reach out to, women, to people in the community in Cameroon, in all the regions of Cameroon. Not only the women. Not only everybody. the women. Everybody who are able, because some people not, might not be able to speak out, but they can go to the neighbor, and the neighbor calls us and gives us the situation. That's the first part. The second part is the legal clinic. You are now setting up a legal clinic, which is going to have two roles. The first role is to educate women on their rights and duties, on what they can do in specific situations. The other uh, part of it is to work with lawyers. We have lawyers that we are going to work with, which can provide support and even um, support cases in court of vulnerable women who do not have means to, 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 to sue to court. So this is what Women International League for Peace and Freedom is doing now based on the results and the recommendation from our former work, namely the gender conflict analysis and also the election observation. All right, 8243 yeah. is the, is goal, the uh, hotline number. Okay, yeah. now you are a peace crusader and the authorities, the government authorities are saying we are doing everything possible to preserve public peace and stability and that is why we are taking decisions, banning undeclared public demonstrations. Mm -hmm. The recent of such decisions came from the governor of the West region mm -hmm. who signed a release banning all undeclared public demonstrations ahead of the planned manifestation by uh, CRM supporters 
sympathizers, militants, and other Cameroonians against what they consider as um, ills in Cameroon. Governance, security, social, economic challenges affecting the country and against the regional elections coming up next. What do you think about such a move? Maybe the, the first thing that I would like to do is that I don't want to, to move into the law. I just want to talk about common sense. When I talk about common sense, I go back a few years back, and I see that for the past years, there have been many uh, protests from different professional groups. I can remember the dog workers, the teachers, the lawyers, the medical personnel, and so on. It shows that there is a profound malaise. And many people for many regions have been jailed. Some have died in prison. Some have, have gone out of prison. Some are still in prison. But it doesn't prevent people from saying that they want to protest. So my, my idea or my analysis is that there is profound malaise in Cameroon. There is serious malaise going on in Cameroon. And the, the way the authorities are reacting to, to it, for me, is not the best way. Because the military response, the, the reprisals are not always the solution. The more reprisals, <laughs> the more problems we have. Look at, we remember, if you look at back in the, few, in the past, in 2008, in 2018, this type of situation or order or decision brought more harm than good. So my advice is that it's very important to, I understand very well that it's about peace and security. But peace and security is about trying to sit together, trying to address the root causes of the conflict. So I think that there is profound malaise because in Cameroon we have not addressed the root causes of the conflict. And one of them, when I hear people talking about the election and then the, 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 the electoral code and so on, I think it is true because what in our report, that was one of the reasons why there are many problems in Cameroon. So it's very important for the government and the population to really address it. If not, whether on the 22nd people go out and they are arrested, the problem will not be solved because the solutions or the way the reprisals are not the solution to this type of situation. It's about dialogue. It's about non-violence. All right, Sylvie Jacqueline Dogmou, you are the president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Cameroon branch, and you also coordinate that organization on the African continent. Thanks for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.